All right. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see you. Thanks for being here. If you've got a Bible, I want you to grab it and go ahead and turn to the New Testament book of Matthew. And when you find Matthew, I want you to find chapter 16 and just hold that ready uh, for a few minutes. I want to welcome all those who are joining us online as well. Uh, we always appreciate having you as a part of our worship experience. And we want to give a special shout out, as always, to those of you at our Church Anywhere location down in the old south side. As you just heard on MPTV, we're beginning a new message series this weekend called Spiritual Rhythms. And what we're going to do for the next few weeks is look at some of the different spiritual disciplines that have the power to transform our personal spiritual lives. And as we begin, I want to take a few minutes to explain what I mean by spiritual disciplines because I don't want to just assume that everyone understands what I'm talking about. And so here's a definition that we're going to use throughout this entire series. Spiritual disciplines are spiritual practices that lead to spiritual transformation. In fact, that's so important, then I'm going to say it again, but this time I want you to join me. Let me hear your voices. Here we go. Spiritual disciplines are spiritual practices that lead to spiritual transformation. That's what we need to hang on to. See, here's the fundamental truth from the Bible about the Christian life. When you become a Christian, God changes your life by covering you in the righteousness of Christ. That's Christianity 101. That's why Paul wrote these words in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. He wrote, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are, and this is the key, in Christ Jesus. Jesus. And what he means by in Christ Jesus is for those of you who are covered by the righteousness of Christ. This is an incredible spiritual truth that we celebrate, or at least we should celebrate, every single day of our lives. But while we have this new position of being in Christ or being covered by the righteousness of Christ, the truth is we're still the same person we always were in the sense that we still have the same weaknesses and we still have the same struggles. And so what the Bible teaches us is that it's God's will for all of us to put our new position of being in Christ, covered by the righteousness of Christ, into practice in the way that we live our lives every single day. And while there are a variety of different ways we can do that, we can put our new position of being in Christ into practice, one of the most important ways to do it is by practicing in our personal lives spiritual disciplines. Because remember our definition, spiritual disciplines are spiritual practices that lead to spiritual transformation. Let's think of it in real practical terms as we begin this series. If I have a new position in Christ that causes God to see me as holy and blameless because Christ is holy and blameless, the question is, how do I put my new position into practice? And, and, and let me just, let me just uh, talk to you about this uh, by using that that. that illustration that I have used probably dozens of times over the years uh, that I call the record book of sin. It's not original with me, but it's called the record book of sin. And the record book of sin illustration says, just imagine my left hand represents my life. This is me. This is the reality and sum total of who I am. And for a moment, let's just use our imagination and think of my Bible as a record book of every single sin I've ever committed in my life. From the time I was the age of accountability, old enough to be held responsible for my actions, my thoughts, uh, my words, and on and on and on. Every single sin I ever committed is recorded in this book. If you take the record book of sin and you place it on my life, that's all you see. All you see is the reality of my sin. I'm completely covered by the reality of my sin. And what the Bible teaches us is that because God is a holy God, even though he loves me and wants to have a relationship with me, he can't because in this condition, I'm completely covered by my sin and a holy God can't live in fellowship with a sinful man. We understand that. That's the first part of the gospel right there. But the Bible goes on to say that because God loves me so much, because he loves you so much, he wasn't content. He wasn't willing to let this be the final reality of our relationship. So he came into the world in the person of his son, Jesus, who was God in human flesh. And when Jesus died on the cross, God literally took all this sin that covered my life and placed it on Jesus and from heaven punished him in my place so that now, 
because of what Jesus has done on the cross, dying to pay the penalty for my sin. When I put my faith and trust in Jesus, I'm no longer covered by my sin. I'm covered by Christ. Somebody say amen to that. That's the good news right there. That's the good news right there. And if you're ever in a situation where you have the opportunity to talk to somebody about what they need to know in order to be right with God, you just tell them that story right there, okay? That's where it all begins. And so the question is, in our lives, if I have this new position now in Christ, not in my sin any longer, but in Christ... And in that new position, God sees me as holy and blameless because Christ is holy and blameless. How do I put that new position into practice? And you know what? The answer isn't complicated. The answer is by being committed to living a holy and blameless life. It's just that simple. And spiritual disciplines are powerful resources to help make that happen, to help me to help you, to help anyone live out the reality of our new position in Christ. So let me take a few minutes as we begin this message series, and I'm going to talk about one specific spiritual discipline here when we get a little bit deeper into the message. But let me take a few minutes uh, by way of introduction to to just give you a little bit of an introduction to spiritual disciplines. I want to tell you five things about spiritual disciplines. These five things aren't original with me. I, I, I read a great article in my study uh, this, uh, well, not this last week, but a couple of weeks ago when I wrote this message by a man named Don Whitney, who's a professor of biblical spirituality at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. And he says these five things about spiritual disciplines, and they were so good, I thought I should share them with you. Number one, spiritual disciplines, and you might want to write these down, spiritual dis disciplines are both personal and corporate. Spiritual disciplines are both personal and corporate. And all that means is that spiritual disciplines are things that we practice alone on our own, but they are also sometimes things that we practice collectively together. What would be a good example of that? How about prayer? We all pray on our own in our personal spiritual lives. I hope you have a daily quiet time where you really, where you really commune with God uh, each and every day in a, a, a meaningful way. But even beyond that, we all pray throughout the day, don't we? We all pray without ceasing throughout the day. I know I do, and I'm sure you do as well. We go through our day praying all the time. We do that personally, but we come to, together as a body in church. And what do we do together? One of the things we do is we pray. We pray together. And so spiritual disciplines are both personal and corporate. Number two, spiritual disciplines, now listen to this, this is important, are activities, not attitudes. That's number two. Spiritual disciplines are activities, not attitudes. In other words, they are things that we do, not things that we feel, not things that we think. They are things that we do. There's a great verse in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. I'm sorry, it won't be on the screen uh, because I thought about it a little bit later. But 1 Corinthians chapter, or Timothy rather, chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul is writing to Timothy. And at the very end of that verse, what we, what we might call 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7b, he says, train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to be godly. And that reminds us that spiritual disciplines, which is... Uh, something that we do that help us live godly lives. Spiritual disciplines are activities, not attitudes. Here's the third thing. Spiritual disciplines are modeled in the Bible. We don't have to wonder or guess what spiritual disciplines are because we have them modeled for us in the Bible. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, or a little more about that in a minute. Number four, spiritual disciplines are encouraged in the Bible. Spiritual disciplines are encouraged in the Bible. I don't think that requires any explanation. And here's the fifth thing. I know I'm going through these fast, but uh, I've, I've got a lot that I need to share with you this weekend. Number five, spiritual disciplines are a means, not an end. And this one's really critical, and I want to talk to you about it for a moment. Spiritual disciplines are a means, not an end. And all I mean by that is this. We aren't spiritually mature because we practice spiritual disciplines. We are spiritually mature because we practice spiritual disciplines. That makes sense, doesn't it? About as much sense as, uh, well, wearing shorts in the winter in Indiana, which a lot of you do, and I'll never understand that even though I've lived here for 20 years. We aren't spiritually mature because we practice spiritual disciplines. Practicing spiritual disciplines 
results in being spiritually mature. Let me just give you this illustration. When Jesus was uh, involved in his vocational ministry uh, during those approximately three years from the time he was 30 to about 33 before he died on the cross, buried in the tomb, was raised from the dead and returned to heavenly glory, he had one group of people that were his constant critics and enemies, and that group of people were the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees in Jesus' day were the religious elite. They were like religious on steroids. That's the Pharisees. And they were that way because they followed all the laws, all the rules, all the regulations when it came to being religious. And because, because of that, they prayed, they fasted, they gave, they worshiped, they did all these things. But at the same time, when Jesus had encounters with the Pharisees, he often called them the same name. Do you know what it was? Hypocrites. He called them hypocrites. Why were they hypocrites? Because they thought their spiritual maturity was tied up in the things that they did, not in the end result of those things. Does that make sense? Gets a little bit more clear now. You can pray every day of your life, but if praying doesn't change your life, you're not spiritually mature. You can fast, you can give, you can worship, you can do all of the things that you know that you're supposed to do. You can come to church every weekend of your life and be faithful in that. But if church never changes you, if it never gets deep down inside of you and convicts you of what's wrong in your life and directs you to what's right and what's needed in your life, then it's not having any impact on your life. And so that's why we need to understand that spiritual disciplines are a means, not an end. Just because you pray doesn't mean you're a prayerful person in the sense of praying makes a difference in your life. Spiritual disciplines are a means, not an end. And so that's what we need to understand. Now, one of the most common questions that I've always been asked over the years related to spiritual disciplines is how many are there? Pastor, how many spiritual disciplines are there? And the truth is, it depends. If you went home uh, after church and you did a Google search using the question, how many spiritual disciplines are there, you'd get a variety of different answers. By the way, I understand that a Google search is not the best way to answer spiritual questions, but because so much information and materials are online, what you would see are the many different thoughts and opinions of individuals, churches, and ministries about how many spiritual disciplines there really are. When I sat down in my office with my son, Andrew, who was just out here to do the communion meditation, and our high school pastor, Matt Pineda, who was on MPTV this weekend, to work out the 2022 preaching calendar, we came up with the idea of this message series called Spiritual Rhythms based on a book written by a man named Richard Foster called Celebration of Discipline. Maybe you've heard of that book. Maybe some of you have read it before. It's all about spiritual disciplines, and in the book's in the book, Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster identifies 12 different spiritual disciplines. At the same time, you can find lists as short as five or as lengthy as 20. And so here's the deal. I'm not ever going to get caught up in the pursuit of what the exact right number is when it comes to spiritual disciplines, uh, are, and you shouldn't either. I just gave you a definition of spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are spiritual practices that lead to spiritual transformation. And I also gave you five things that you need to understand about spiritual disciplines that, that kind of identify or qualify what really are spiritual disciplines. One of those was spiritual disciplines are modeled in the Bible. And so that's what we need to remember when we try to determine how many there are and what is and what isn't a spiritual discipline. So if you came up to me after service and said your favorite dis spiritual discipline was gardening, I would just look at you and say, listen, I, that's not a spiritual discipline. I don't want to be rude. I don't want to be condescending, but gardening is not a spiritual discipline. And you could look at ba back at me with great sincerity and you could say something like, I don't know what to tell you, pastor. Reading and studying the, Bi studying the Bible does it for you when it comes to spiritual growth, but gardening does it for me. And I would respond by saying, show me that in the Bible. Now, I could back up my belief that reading and studying the Bible is a spiritual discipline. I could go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, where Paul says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. I could go to 2 Timothy 3.16, where Paul writes and says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And I could go to others. But you can't find a verse like that in the Bible about gardening. And so while I don't have a single thing against gardening other than I don't want to do it, the Bible does not give us examples of gardening as spiritual 
as a spiritual discipline. Just think of it like this. If everything is a spiritual discipline, nothing's a spiritual discipline. How many of you know what I'm talking about? If everything is a spiritual discipline, then nothing is a spiritual discipline. And while gardening might make you feel closer to God because you're outdoors and you're dealing with God's creation, it's not a spiritual discipline. Remember our definition. Spiritual disciplines are spiritual practices that lead to spiritual transformation. And this spiritual transformation, friends, is something that God is so very serious about. Spiritual transformation in your life and mine is a big deal to God. The Bible talks about it a lot. Let me give you an example. Look at these words on the screen from 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. Peter writes and says, Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, note this, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. And friends, that is a great description of spiritual transformation, growing up in our salvation. Understanding that through our faith in Christ, God now looks at us as holy and blameless in Christ because Christ is holy and blameless. And so now we want to grow up in that by living on a practical level each and every day of our lives, a life that is holy and blameless. That's growing up in your salvation. That spiritual transformation. How about these words on the screen from Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. This is a familiar verse. Paul says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Then he says, but be transformed. Everyone say transformed. Transformed. This is what God wants for all of us. This is a part of his universal will for all believers in, this, in that it's the same for you as it is for me. He said, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And we renew our minds through the word of God. And as we renew our minds through the word of God, we become more and more in touch with what the will of God is, not just for our lives, but in every part of life. Now, I could cite more verses, but I hope you get the picture about what we're talking about with regard to spiritual disciplines and the role they play in our personal spiritual transformation. When you became a Christian, God gave you a brand new life. Somebody say amen to that. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he said, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Remember what he said? He said, the old is gone and the new has come. And that word new there in, in the original language is not a word that means new in the sense of time because you can't go back and start your life over again. It means new in the sense of quality. The quality of your life has changed. And God sees you as holy and blameless in Christ because Christ is holy and blameless. And now, What God's expectation is for you as a Christian is that your life begins to reflect the reality of the new life that he's given you. And one of the best ways for that to happen is through the practice of spiritual disciplines that lead to spiritual transformation. Now, I'm going to stop there when it comes to the introduction of this series on spiritual disciplines. And I'm going to talk to you about one discipline in particular this weekend that I think is not just important, but I think it's foundational to all of the spiritual disciplines. I'm going to talk to you about the spiritual discipline of submission. And I'm going to talk to you about the spiritual discipline of submission because Jesus, who is our model, who is our model in every part of life, lived a life of submission. In fact, let's look at these words on the screen from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. This is a great passage of Scripture, surely one of our favorites. Paul says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now note this, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, here's what that means in simple terms. When Jesus came into the world, he voluntarily laid aside the privileges of his heavenly position and of his authority as God. Because remember, Jesus was God the Son. We we believe the Bible teaches there's one God who exists at all times in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And so when Jesus came in the world, he voluntarily laid aside the privileges of his heavenly position and his authority as God in order to come into the world and identify with man, to identify with 
people like you and me, and that's what it means, or that's what Paul is talking about when he says in that passage of Scripture in Philippians 2 that Jesus made himself nothing. He made himself nothing. And the reason why Jesus did that was his submission to God the Father. Jesus was willing to lay aside his heavenly position, his heavenly privileges, and his heavenly authority and become one of us because of his submission to God the Father and his plan to provide the opportunity for forgiveness of sin and a brand new life for ordinary people like you and me. And so we learn from Jesus, and you might want to write this down, that submission is the spiritual discipline of laying aside our will for the will of God the Father. Let me say that one more time. We learn from Jesus that submission is the spiritual discipline of laying aside our will for the will of God the Father. And here's something that we need to understand about the will of God the Father. His will is always right. His will is always perfect. And his will is always focused on what's best for you. And that brings us to Matthew 16. That's a long introduction, wasn't it? But that brings us to Matthew 16. So if you got your Bibles open there and you're able, go ahead and stand with me and we're going to read some scripture together. Matthew chapter 16, and this is a pretty familiar passage of scripture. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to read verses 21 through 26. You follow along as I read. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on that third day, or on the third day, rather, be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Boy, those aren't words you want to hear from Jesus. Somebody say amen to that. We don't want to hear those words from Jesus. But Jesus pulled him aside and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? All right, there it is. Go ahead and be seated. We always ask God to bless the reading and the hearing of his word. I know uh, that this is a familiar passage of scripture, but let's talk about it for a few minutes. I don't know if you remember this or not from uh, a few years ago when we were going verse by verse through the gospel of Matthew. But when we got to this passage of scripture in our study of Matthew that we called Let's Talk About Jesus, I told you that this passage marked a shift in the earthly ministry of Jesus. And I describe the shift like this. Up to this point in Jesus' earthly ministry, his focus has been primarily on the crowds that followed him. But when we get to this passage of Scripture, he shifted his focus from the crowds to his disciples. And the question is, what caused that shift? Well, what caused that shift is what happens just before this passage, and you can either look back in your Bible or turn the page back in your Bible. It's what happened in Matthew chapter 16 when Peter made what we call this great or good confession related to Christ. Remember, Jesus and the disciples were in an area called Caesarea Philippi. Some of you have been to the Holy Land with me. You've been to Caesarea Philippi. You can remember that place. It's very distinctive there. And Jesus was there with the disciples, and he asked them, who do men say that I am? And after a few wrong answers, remember, Peter speaks up, and in Matthew chapter 16, and in verse 16, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's what signaled the shift. Because when Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, then Jesus knew in that moment that Peter and all the disciples for the first time really understood exactly who he was. 
And so he turns his attention away from the crowds. He didn't ignore the crowds completely, but for the most part, he turned his attention away from the crowds and began to focus on the disciples because he wanted to prepare the disciples for what they were going to face, what they were going to need to do once he was gone. It was a great moment for Peter. Remember, Jesus went on to say, blessed are you, uh, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven revealed this. He said, and you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. But in the spirit of the truth that you very rarely have the good without the bad in life, how many of you know that's true? Peter's mountaintop moment didn't last very long. And we just saw that. In Matthew 16 and verse 21, after Jesus tells the disciples that he's going to Jerusalem, and when he's in Jerusalem, he's going to suffer many things. He's going to be killed, and he's also going to rise from the dead. Peter is listening to all this, but Peter, probably feeling a little bit cocky from his recent success, decides he doesn't like that plan. It doesn't sound good to him. And so in Matthew 16, 22, he pulls Jesus aside and he says, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And in reply, Jesus says those words, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Now note this, because you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And friends, there it is. Because you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. There it is. One minute, Peter is speaking the very words of God. And the next, he's going out of his way to block the will of God. And the reason why was a lack of submission on Peter's part to the ultimate will of God. And so Jesus responds with those harsh words. And then he goes on to talk about what's required to really, truly follow him in verses 24 through 28. And in verses 24 through 28, I want to show you two very powerful and important things we learn about the spiritual discipline of submission. If you'd like to take notes, write down this first thing. Submission helps us follow God's plan, not our own. Submission helps us follow God's plan, not our own. One of the most difficult parts of genuine spiritual transformation, which is the end result of spiritual disciplines, is changing our way of thinking from our plan to God's plan. That's why submission is so important. And you see that in Peter's response to Jesus telling the disciples he was going to Jerusalem, he was going to suffer many things, and he was going to die and be raised from the dead. Because, you see, the prevailing belief at that time among the Jews, including Peter, was that when the Messiah would come, he would establish an earthly political kingdom and rule the world. But that prevailing belief about the Messiah was wrong. It was a man-made belief. It was a man-made plan. It wasn't God's plan. God's plan for the Messiah was that he would come into the world, that he would live a perfect life, that he would die on the cross, and then on the third day be raised from the dead. And what we see in our text with regard to Peter is that Peter liked his view, he liked his idea, he liked his plan of what the Messiah would do better than he liked God's. And so he tried to set Jesus straight but Jesus made it clear to Peter that he didn't need to change his ways of thinking. It was Peter who needed to change, and he needed to change by being submissive. Everyone say submissive. Submissive to the will of God, to God's plan. And so here's the first lesson about submission. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you've got to be fully committed to his plan for your life, not your own. Not your own. And here's something that we all need to remember. God's plan is always going to be better than ours. God's plan is always going to be better than yours. And it's always going to be better than mine. It's probably going to be harder than yours and harder than mine. But it's always going to be better. And so, the first thing we have to understand is that submission helps us follow God's plan, not our own. Write down this second thing. The second thing is that submission comes with a significant cost. Submission comes with a significant co cost. Now we go back to Matthew 16 and verse 24 uh, where 
Jesus, when he was talking about the necessity of submission, says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so Jesus talks about three things that make submission difficult. The first thing he talks about is the need to deny yourself. What does that mean? Well, let's just put it in simplest terms possible. It means saying no to me and yes to God. It means saying no to me and yes to God. In fact, say this with me right here. Let me hear your voices. Saying no to me and yes to God. That's what it means to deny yourself. Saying no to me and yes to God. And let's get real practical. This is important because this is where the spiritual discipline of submission facilitates or sets the stage for spiritual transformation in our lives. When we get to the place in our lives where we say no to me and yes to God, that's the foundation start point for the beginning of spiritual transformation. Listen, because just because, there, just because you do other things that may or may not fall into the category of spiritual disciplines doesn't mean that you're practicing the ultimate spiritual discipline of submission. And that's what we need to understand. You can read, study, and meditate on God's word for hours every single day of your life. Those are spiritual disciplines. You can set aside time to pray and talk to God, and then you can follow that time up with times of solitude and silence so you can hear from God. Those are spiritual disciplines. You can fast from things to make more room for God in your life. That's a spiritual discipline. You can come together with God's people for worship. Every time the doors to the worship center are open, every time you have an opportunity, that's a corporate spiritual discipline. You can do all of those things and more, but if you're not willing to surrender your will to God's will, then none of it matters. None of it. Submission is the foundation of spiritual disciplines. We're never going to experience spiritual transformation in our lives until we get to a place where we say no to ourselves and yes to God about the way we live our lives. Since we're in the Gospel of Matthew, I want you to hold your place there in chapter 16, and I want to hear some pages turning back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm not hearing any pages. That just makes me so sad. Matthew chapter 5. Now we're in the Sermon on the Mount. And if we get to Matthew chapter 5 and the Sermon on the Mount, we looked at it at verse 38. We read through verse 38 through verse 42. This is what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Let's stop right there. Now, having read that, Here's a great question. Do any of the things that Jesus just said that we need to do come naturally to anyone here? No. They don't come naturally to any of us. We're not wired that way. And the only way we can embrace those instructions from Jesus is through the spiritual discipline of submission that causes us to say no to me and yes to God. Now pick it up in verse 43. Let's read a little bit further. Down through verse 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? And then verse 48, Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. What is Jesus saying in those verses? Well, I don't have time to go into detail, so I would say, first of all, Jesus is saying, listen, if you're going to follow me, I want you to be different than just other people. I want you to be more than just another sinner. I want you to live a life that's distinct and different from the rest of the world. And then he finishes it off by saying in verse 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Talk about pressure. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's just think about that for a minute because, you know, when I think about that, because that verse has always troubled me a little bit because I, I, I read those words and I think about my life and I think how much of a miserable failure I am to live up to Jesus' words when he says, be perfect, Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So I want to understand that verse. And when I study it, there are two ways you can look at it, at least from my perspective. First, 
you can understand that the word Jesus uses for perfect there in the original language of the New Testament is the Greek word teleos. And the Greek word teleos is one of those words that's multifaceted in that it has multiple meanings depending on the context. And one of the meanings that that word teleos can have is the meaning of complete or mature. Well, I like that. I'm, I mean, that's going to be a struggle for me already, but I like that better than perfect. And we are, we are talking about spiritual transformation. We are talking about growing in our lives to be more complete and more mature. And so that makes sense. That's one way to look at it. The second way to look at it is that we understand because this Greek word teleos has, is a multifaceted word, which means it has multiple meanings depending on the context, we understand that one of the meanings is exactly the way it's used in my NIV Bible, in our English Bibles, as perfect. Jesus is talking about perfection. And honestly, as much as I want to gravitate to the first meaning, this is probably the more accurate meaning here because what he said in Matthew 5.48 is, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And God is perfect in every way. He's not just complete. He's not just mature. He's literally perfect. And so how do we understand that in regard to our lives and the growth that God wants to see in our lives? Well, we understand that perfection is not something that's possible for you, and it's not something that's possible for me or for anyone in our own power. So the only way it's possible to even scratch the surface surface of what perfection means here is by completely surrendering and submitting our lives to the will of God and the transforming power of God. And that only happens when we come to a place in our lives where we're willing to say no to me and yes to God in everything. Second thing he told us to do is to take up our cross. He said, deny yourself, and he said, take up your cross. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about some difficulty that they're going through in life, and they'll say, I guess that's just my cross to bear. You ever heard somebody say something like that? Maybe you've said something like that. I guess that's just my cross to bear. I don't like that. I don't like that, the use of that term uh, as it relates to what Jesus is talking about here, and it's not even close to what Jesus is talking about here because when Jesus says that we need to take up our cross, he's not talking about a circumstance. He's talking about an attitude, and that's what we need to remember. In fact, you should write that in the margin of your Bible. Jesus is not talking about a circumstance. When he says take up your cross, he's not talking about a circumstance. He's talking about an attitude. See, the disciples who were all Jews, were not conflicted or confused when Jesus or anyone else for that matter would talk about the cross because they knew what the cross meant. They knew what the cross stood for. It meant and stood for one thing and one thing only, and that was literal physical death. And so Peter and the other disciples understood that when Jesus said, take up your cross, he was saying, if you're going to come after me, you've got to be so committed to me that you're willing to pay the ultimate price for following me, and that is even the price of death. I love the way Luke records this same event in his gospel because he adds a little different nuance to Jesus' words when he said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. In Luke's gospel, in Luke 9, 23, he says, deny yourself, and he says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Take up your cross daily and follow me. And that makes it even more real to me because the truth is, unless something dramatically changes, you and I living in the United States of America are, are probably not ever going to be forced to give up our lives for following Christ. At least we hope and pray that it never comes to that, right? But you and I living in the United States or anywhere in the world for that matter need to take up our cross daily as we follow Christ because every single day we need to die to ourselves so we can live for him. And that's what he's talking about here. And then the third thing he says is, follow me. And in the spirit of simplicity, this means we need to be willing to do what Jesus would do in every area of life. We need to follow him. This is the kind of life that God has called us to. And whether or not we do these things, whether or not we decide to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow him, 
they are so important because of what's at stake when it comes to whether or not we do those things. Because here's what's at stake. Jesus went on to say in verses 25 and 26 of Matthew 16, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses it, whoever loses his life for me will find it. And then he says, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Everything that matters is at stake when it comes to this spiritual discipline of submission. Because the life that God calls us to is so much more than just coming to church when it fits our schedule or giving something in the offering or serving in some capacity from time to time. The life that Jesus calls us to is a life of giving everything we have to him. Giving him all of our dreams, all of our hopes, all of our plans, every single part of our lives. It's a life that changes every aspect of our life. It changes the way we approach our life, the way we approach our career, the way we approach our marriage, the way we approach parenting, the way we approach our finances, the way we approach our free time, the way we interact with other people, both friends and strangers, and on and on and on, because it's a life of every single day saying no to me and yes to God in every part of life. No part is exempt. But when we do that, we end up with a life that is far beyond anything that we could imagine or hope for on our own. And it all comes to the foundational spiritual discipline of submission. So here's how I want to close. Now, I know I'm a little over time. I'll do this quickly. I'm going to close by just asking this question. How do I practice the spiritual discipline of submission beyond the things that we've talked about from the scriptures in Matthew chapter 16? In the most practical way possible, how do I begin to practice the spiritual discipline of submission? I'm going to give you four things. I'm going to do this real quickly. Write these down. Number one, here's my first thing. Slow down. And can I tell you that I wrote that as the number one thing because that's the number one thing for me. Slow down. I don't know why. I can't really give it an explanation. But my pace of life has always been fast. In everything that I do, including things that don't even need to be fast, that don't really matter. It's a constant struggle in my life, this pace of life. But when we slow down, we give ourselves the chance to practice the spiritual discipline of submission because when we slow down, we have the opportunity to focus on God and not whatever we're doing or whatever our plan is in the moment. And the Bible says there is so much value and benefit to slowing down and waiting on God. Waiting on God to take the lead in our lives. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 33, verses 20 through 22 say, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Isaiah 40, 31 says, but those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. We need to slow down, slow down. So we can give God his proper place in our life, which is out front, leading every part of our life. Number two, write this down. Speak less, not more. Speak less, not more. One of the things Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew that really strikes my heart is, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And let me ask you a question. Have you ever regretted something that you've said? Have you ever regretted something that you said and then tried to defend it or apologize for it by saying something like this? Listen, that's not really who I am. You know what the truth is? That really is who you are. That really is who I am, at least on some level. It might not be all that I am, but on some level, that really is who I am. I'm the person who spoke those words. 
that I wish I could take back. You're that person as well. One way to practice the spiritual discipline of submission is to simply speak less, not more. As we continue to pursue a life that reflects the character of Jesus, think about the trouble we would save ourselves. Think about the, uh, the lessons we would stop learning the hard way. Think about how closer we would be to God and the person God wants us to be if we, kept, if we stopped making so many mistakes with our words. Proverbs 13, uh, 10, 17 says, where words are many, sin is not absent. Boy, is that true. Proverbs 13, 3 says, he who guards his lip guards his life. But he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. Number three, look for ways to honor others above yourself. And this should be something that's at the top of our list every single day. We should wake up every day and, and, and as a part of our daily prayer, say, God, help me, to, help me to recognize a situation today where I can honor someone else above myself, where I can put someone else's needs above my own, where I can say you first, not me first. Paul said in Philippians 2, 3 through 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. And here's number four. Write this down. Every day we should pray these words from John the Baptist. John the Baptist's words. John chapter 3 and verse 30. When he said this about Jesus, he said, he must become greater. I must become less. The spiritual discipline of submission is captured in those words. He must become greater. I must become less. Pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you so much for a chance to talk about these things. This is so important, and I'm, I know I've gone a little over time uh, trying to introduce the series as well as talk about this particular discipline, but I pray that your Holy Spirit would really take all of these truths and apply them to our hearts. We want to be pleasing to you. We want, to, we want our lives to reflect the life of Jesus. We want to experience the, tra the spiritual transformation that you want us to experience. And there's a lot of ways to do that, but at the top of the list would be spiritual disciplines, and they all begin with the spiritual discipline of submission, where we say no to my will and yes to yours in every part of life. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and sing.